Hi, and welcome to Magic Numbers. Uh, this is episode number 27, and today we're going to be talking about marrying your first pick. So what I'm going to focus on is differences in ALSA across the packs. I'm going to also maybe display ALSA in a graphic way so that you can understand better what numbers are hidden behind this one thing that um, 17lens.com spits out. And also we're going to look at the difference uh, about uh, in win rates between the first pick uh, being played or not being played and which first picks are particularly successful. So we're going to look at should you be marrying this first pick of yours or maybe that's not absolutely necessary. Um, and as the last section, we're going to look at the anatomy of a successful draft. And um, this is very vague on purpose so that you actually have your attention spiking, but I will explain everything as we go around. So uh, sit down and enjoy the ride. And as always, I'm gonna start with the preamble. And this is my soapboxy moment when I spent a couple of minutes warming up in my speaking and talking about one topic that is maybe loosely related to the seminar, maybe not, uh, we'll see. And this time my thesis is even best developed metric can't be followed blindly. And that's why I picked the card picture uh, to accompany it, it's subtlety. Uh, today we're going to talk about ALSA, and ALSA is the metric that uh, all the 17 lens users know. It's the average last seen as, and it's a measure of how late does a card go in a pack. So if ALSA is low, you only see it in the first couple of picks. If ALSA is high, the card always wheels. And um, you would think, well, this is a very simple and uh, uh, straightforward metric. As I hopefully will show you today, it's not. Uh, there's a uh, some level of subtlety behind it. And when you think about it, this actually does change a bit uh, how you should strategize during your draft. And every single metric should be looked at with this kind of careful approach. I think that looking at only win rates is a very quick road to jumping into wrong conclusions because as I showed in previous seminars, uh, even if you look at the white green win rate uh, of a particular card, not white green decks are equal and sometimes a card will be actually good in a deck even though it's generally not very good in white green decks and your deck is white green because you will have a very particular build and you should look at it um, with some uh, caution just blindly following win rates might miss you a good card for your deck uh, because you didn't um, because you didn't take into account that your deck is maybe not your average run of the mill uh, white green deck so we always have to look at those things uh, in a subtle way if you want to get further. The raw win rates will get you quite far because it's good to know how cards should be evaluated. But to reach like true mastery of the game and true mastery of the draft, you rather should focus on figuring out at least some basic levels of this complexity. And as you become a better and better limited player, um, you can basically ignore the data in some part, use them as guidelines, but still follow your uh, intuition because you will know better. You know, I do think that um, you can do quite a lot with data and the deeper you go and the more granular your data sets are, so you, the more into it you get and the more you try to nitpick, the more um, uh, subtle conclusions you can reach. And of course, no one has time to fully analyze the set. Uh, I run probably 10 seminars for each set. And I basically only scrape the surface of uh, the complexity within each set. And hopefully, you know, with a couple of uh, years of the, um, of the uh, seminars, we're going to at least touch on many topics that uh, uh, I can't do for every set, but uh, some of them will be touched and you can build up a database of those subtle approaches to the data. And this is what I try to do as a content creator dealing with data and, and limited magic the gathering i try to also draw attention um, that you can't demand simple answers every single time because sometimes the answers are just not simple and i would even um, gamble a guess that uh, most often the answers are not a straightforward yes and no and uh, we have to somehow uh, learn how to Accept the fact that reality is not simple and sometimes the answer can be very complicated. And I think that, you know, this is my part of science outreach that I'm doing while running those seminars. I'm trying to draw attention to people that it never is easy and there's always special cases and there's always fringe cases and there's always moments when following the data blindly um, will lead you into uh, 
into a, a bad outcome. Right, that goes for my preamble. Then let's start with the topic of the day. What is ALSA? That's the average last seen as measure. And if you go to 17lens.com and you look at the table with all the data for every card, you will see that one of them is ALSA and that basically tells you how late cards go. So if something has an ALSA of exactly one, it means that this card is never seen past. Like in all the drafts that 17 lands logged, it never was seen to be passed. Um, um, uh, so everyone first picks it. And you can imagine like some super mythic bombs, uh, they will have ALSA that is very, very close to one. Um, <clears throat> when uh, WOTC uh, tweaked the bots to rare drafts so that they wouldn't give free gems to people, um, some rares had an ALSA of exactly one, bots never passed it if they always picked it independently of the situation. But of course, in most cases, it's not going to be that uh, extreme. So lots of the cards will have like also between one and a half and maybe two and a half. And these are going to be like top rares <clears throat> and maybe uh, all the best uncommons in the set. Um, cards with like three to five are going to be good uncommons and top commons. And then if you go lower, then you start going into this uh, uh, chaff. I've been past mascot exhibition, but it shouldn't have happened. No, it, it, it happened very rarely and I wouldn't know why. Um, so high ALSA cards are the ones that will wheel frequently and you, uh, you may uh, want to look at the ALSA numbers. If you, for instance, are in your draft and you're uh, in pack three and you see two cards uh, that you think are sort of like equally good for your deck, you might want to pick the one with the lower ALSA because you might hope that the one with the higher ALSA will somehow wheel. There is no guarantee in it, but at least you give yourself a shot at that. And if you think that the cards are relatively even, you can use that kind of strategy. If you you know roughly know the ALSA or check it quickly during the draft, um, you can uh, use that as a strategy tool for you. And also looking at cards that have a high win rate and also high ALSA, which means good cards that are not being drafted uh, a lot you can actually uh, figure out which colors are open. And I do that in some of my other analysis, but not today. Today, we're going to dig a bit deeper into ALSA because um, it's not as simple as just one number. And that's because draft is very different in pack one and pack three. So in pack one, you start with zero cards and you have to find your lane. So usually it happens like you open a first pack, you see a bomb or you see a very good uncommon, you pick this. And then you try to sort of carve your lane and sometimes around this first pick, sometimes you have to abandon your first pick, but you will spend those first, you know, five to seven picks trying to find the lane um, at le or several lanes uh, that you can pivot from um, and, 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 and trying to, you know, position yourself as best as possible for the next packs. Now, pack three is completely different because in pack three, you start with 30 cards already in your pool. So you have like at least a very good outline of the deck. And sometimes you actually well, almost have a deck and you will spend all your pack three finding those little bits that will improve it. Because maybe you missed something on interaction. Well, then you prioritize the interaction. Maybe you missed your fixing and then you will focus on fixing. And sometimes you will pick the fixing over some decent card because you already have decent cards, but you don't have fixing. So adding fixing to your deck is improving um, your uh, potential win rate. So you're collecting those missing elements from your deck and you try to fine tune it. Um, and uh, especially when you, knew that, when you already know that you made it on playables, you can actually make some very questionable picks in pack one, but in pack three, they are very well uh, motivated. And the, Example I'm giving here is imagine you're opening a bomb red rare and you're in white blue control deck. You're opening a bomb red rare with double pips that's good in aggro deck, let's say at sushi, because why not? And you look at your white blue deck and you think, oh, there's no way I can fit it. I don't have enough fixing. Uh, it would be very risky to play it. It's a double pipped card. It's not even that much according to my plan. So you just pass it. Now, rewind the draft to the beginning and imagine you open the Atsushi, the uh, four mana, four, four flying uh, red dragon with some busted abilities when it dies. Imagine you open it in pack one. You snap pick it because it's definitely going to be the best card in your uh, pack. So in pack one, you would definitely pick it. In pack three, it's already situational, which means that 
alpha of that card in pack one will be different from alpha of that card in pack three. In pack one, you will rarely see it past uh, first pick. In pack three, you might see it past because if it happens so that uh, two people um, on your side are not drafting red and you're in red and one of them opened the Atsushi, you probably will get it unless they are rare drafting. So based on that, you can imagine that the alpha of cards in pack one and pack three is going to be at least somewhat different. I'm not going to say that it's going to be um, uh, completely different, but I think it might be significantly different. And this is exactly what I did. I tried to calculate how does the alpha differ from pack one to pack three. Now, before we move to the actual data part, um, I lost the plot here. Um, I, I was thinking about, I should get my tea. Um, so yeah, I regained my plot with the tea. I think that that was exactly the thing that I was missing. In 17lines.com, when you go to see ALSA, it gives you a collated ALSA for every single pack. So when you look at this number, it's one number and it doesn't look at whether it's pick pack one, pick pack two or pack three. <clears throat> so without further ado, let's go into the data. And here we have the first graph. Basically on this axis, we have uh, ALSA and pack one that I calculated from the 17 lands data. Um, uh, so basically these cards will be the, the, you know, the, the priority cards, the bombs, the good uncommons. Here we will have good commons, um, uh, decent uncommons. And here we have the chaff and this little dot here is the basic lands, which no one picks. Uh, well, almost no one picks. Uh, so they will be on this, uh, on this line. So basically the more right you go on the graph, um, uh, the lower, the, the lower priority cards you will see, and probably the lower impact cards you will see. Um, and on this graph, we see the difference in ALSA uh, between pack one and pack three. Uh, so if the ALSA increases, the card becomes more available because the higher the ALSA, the more available the card. And the, uh, the, 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 the bigger decrease of ALSA between pack one and pack three, uh, it means that the card is less available in the pack. So uh, some cards are actually highly prioritized in, um, in pack three. And uh, you see them, it's probably these, this, these bunch, and we will try to figure out what they are. And some cards just don't change. But what you can see from the graph is that usually the high priority, the, 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 the busted bombs, uh, the, the rares and the powerful un uncommons, you will see more of them in pack three because their ALSA increases. And there are some cards that will decrease, um, um, will become uh, less available in pack three. And we'll try to figure out why is that the case. Um, okay, so let's look at them. I divided them into three categories. I divided the cards very arbitrarily as um, ALSA below three, ALSA between three and six, and ALSA below six, because that sort of divides it into two thirds. There are even numbers, which I don't know, human brain likes even numbers. So, um, so I did it this way. Um, and also because they are so different category cards that I didn't want to compare them like to like. Oh, but before we go there, in case you have a problem with uh, imagining ALSA, I took one card from the set, and this is going to be my, uh, I talk in detail about one card segment that I normally add at the end of the form, uh, presentation, but this time I will look at it uh, at the beginning. And this is comparing the Behold the Unspeakable uh, different ALSA with pack one and pack three. So just to visualize how late you see it and what is the difference in ALSA and um, what does it mean for your drafting. So as you can see, in pack one and pack two, pack one being red, pack three being uh, uh, blue, in pack one and pack three, you see roughly the same amount of them as your first pick. And that shouldn't surprise you because you will open and you will always see it as a first pick. So uh, it should be relatively even because by chance you should see the same amount of uh, Behold the Unspeakables. And in the 20,000 drafts I uh, analyzed, you saw roughly 1,000 um, uh, Behold the Unspeakables as the first pick and um, uh, in, uh, in, in pack one and in pack three. Um, and you still see more or less the same amount of them in as pick two. So it's pick 
as the first pick quite frequently because you see that it should be run 150 times out of a thousand. So 15% of the time it will be first picked and you will not see it in pack two because when you can imagine, they should be open more or less at the same frequency in every single of those uh, picks. So you should see around a thousand of them in every, uh, in every column if they would be never picked. But around 15% of them get first picked uh, in, in, in either pack one and pack three. Uh, so you see around 850 of them. There is no difference between pack one and pack three. Now, if we go a bit later to third pick, you see the difference. There is already 500 of them in uh, pack one. So around half of the Behold the Unspeakables are picked in the first two picks. But six, 627 of them in uh, pack three. So you actually see the difference between uh, pack one and pack three. Uh, and you see that uh, it's around, uh, what is it, 12%. So you will only lose 37% of the beholds that were opened uh, in your third pick on average. And this difference prevails. So at pick four, you have 300 to 450. At pick five, you have 131 to 300. Uh, and then you have like 80 to 220 ish. Then you have 50 to 137. But you see more of the Behold the Unspeakable in pack three, because as I said, people are already prioritizing other things. Maybe they are in different colors. And um, I think that the part of that is that um, in some pods, they will just go quite far because there is not many blue uh, drafters, for example. Uh, and this will uh, sort of pimp those numbers um, when you will see 60 Time. So 6% of the time, uh, Behold the Unspeakable wield in, um, in pack three in, in, those, um, uh, in, 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 in those drafts that I observed. Well, I say 6% because there should be around a thousand of them and you see 60 here, so around 6%. While in pack one, it happens 1% of the time. And someone really lucky, as uh, the chat observed, even got um, Behold the Unspeakable uh, as the last pick in a draft, which is beyond uh, beyond believable, but it happened once. You need 20,000 drafts for that, but it, once it happened that no one really wanted to behold the unspeakable. And keep in mind that because of the structure of the data that I had, uh, some of those drafts are from the early format when people just didn't maybe realize how powerful sagas are and um, things happen in the first days because we also get lots of maybe less invested players that uh, just draft because they, they feel like and uh, maybe they, they miss on the card power. So all those differences between um, between uh, the prevalence of uh, Behold the Unspeakable in packs, they amount to a majestic difference of around 0. Point, what is 0. 0.8? Do the math. Yes, 0. 0.8 in ALSA. So this is the difference between 245 and 324 of ALSA between pack one and pack three. So here you see it more early in the red bars. Here you see it later in the blue bars, and that just is uh, 0.8 of ALSA. And that means that um, roughly per 1,000 um, uh, per 1,000 Behold the Unspeakables you'll see in the pack one, you'll see 1,300 of them in uh, pack three. So this is the way for you to maybe try to visualize better what differences in ALSA constitute. And they will look slightly different for different cards. Uh, this is a relatively highly picked card. I assume that for cards that are picked later, this graph will look more like a bell curve of some sort, maybe like a skewed bell curve. And, and, and there will be also differences at different picks, basically, for different cards. But for Behold the Unspeakable, a relatively good uncommon that is picked relatively early, this is how it's going to look like. And it's also interesting to see that 6% of the time it will wheel uh, in pack three. So sometimes, you know, when you have um, a busted blue rare, you might want to uh, maybe gamble this uh, Behold the Unspeakable and hope that, you know, six, time out, uh, six times out of um, uh, 100, it will actually wheel. So, um, okay. So let's move to the cards that uh, have the biggest differences in ALSA. So these are the cards that um, are high picks. So ALSA between one and three in, 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 in pack one that are dropping in priority in pack three. So you can see them earlier. And uh, weirdly, the, the highest numbers are on the right, but okay, let's live with that. Um, 
so the one that loses the value the most is Ryu Storm's Edge. That's the uh, white red uh, rare. Then we have Satoru Umezawa. That's the blue black rare. Then we have Rizona, another white red rare. Grease Fang Okiba Boss, a white black rare. And you see that the theme of those first is that these are multicolor rares. And multicolor cards are much higher to accommodate into your random deck. So uh, you will more likely have neighbors that don't play this particular color combination, especially if you navigated your draft well and you realized that certain colors were cut off and certain were not. So you will instantly see that um, uh, multicolor cards are going to be uh, a big... Um, a big gain for you. If you pick the right color and someone in your neighborhood opened the rare in your two colors, then you have a chance of getting it much later in, um, in pack three because you are in the right color and no one in your neighborhood is picking them. Then we see Behold the Unspeakable and I have no idea why and Leaf Spring Avenger and I have no idea why. Okay, whatever. Um, my computer did something weird that I have no idea. Um, but these cards also drop in priority, and maybe that's something to do with the fact that they're actually quite highly picked in the first uh, pack. And then later you just see the effect that, well, if you're not green, if you're not blue, especially Behold the Unspeakable has a double pip uh, cost in your um, in, in uh, mana cost. So uh, maybe splashing it is not an option. Springleaf Avenger also technically has a double green, but um, practically you can pay just one green into it. Um, but such are the results. Other cards you see is Weaver of Harmony, and I think that this one is also particularly because people want to pick it and build around it, and same with Cami of Transients, and maybe later um, uh, they prioritize it less. Um, and we see Fable of Mirror Breaker, Thousand Faced Thief, is it? And Goro Goro, the Red Legend, um, that are picked less. But I wouldn't put too much stock in those cards. I think that these ones are important because they show a trend. Multicolor cards will um, will be seen quite uh, quite quite later. Okay, um, I pick cards that increase in priority in pick three, and I use the word increase in priority very loosely because some of them decrease but slightly less, whatever. Um, but uh, the interesting part that I saw there is that uh, among the cards that actually are picked higher in, in pack three, we have Sokenzan, um, Takenuma, and Otawara, and also Boseju the lands, which means that probably, and the uh, pack one, you don't want to pick those lands uh, as early because um, you still don't know if you're in the right lane. But when you're sure of your lane, you may think that actually picking up a land that is taking my basic land slot that actually can do something useful uh, in the later game is a good strategy and they will pick them higher because they already know, okay, I'm in black, I can pick this Takanuma for my collection also and it's going to improve my deck. So. Um, um, so, uh, and, and I, I will make it on the playables and I know my lane, so I know that for 100% of the time I will play it. Um, so people uh, prioritize them earlier. Then the weird one is Invoke Despair. I have no explanation for that, why, why, why it doesn't lose uh, appeal uh, over the game. And, but then we have a nice uh, trend of Eater of Virtue, Reckoner, Reckoner Bankbuster, Mecha Titan Core, Circuit Mender, and Search Hacker Mech, all of them being colorless. Colorless cards don't use value in pack three because you can put them in any deck because they're bloody colorless. I mean, it's pretty obvious. And um, and Wandering Emperor is another one. And I think that this one has to do with uh, uh, potential red drafting as well. I mean, the card is powerful, don't get me wrong, but I think that people need it for their construct decks as well. So they will just snap it because it's, well, free mythic basically. So uh, why not? And yeah, I mean, I wouldn't exclude that um, there is also the rare drafting, um, the rare drafting um, aspect of the of the um, legendary lands uh, being picked so early as well. Okay, let's go to the mid pick packs, and this is between Alsa three and six uh, in the um, in the pack one, and there are some cards that you will see much later. Uh, and these include Invigorating Hot Spring, Silver Fur Master, Enthusiastic Mechanoth, Prodigy Prototype, 
Naomi Pillar of Order, Jukai Naturalist, Onikalt Anvil, Colossal Sky Turtle, Gloom Shrieker. These are the top, whatever, uh, blah, nine. And as you can see, they share one thing. Every single one of them is the uh, signpost uncommon that is multicolor. All the multicolor uncommons are going to go much later in uh, pack three. They go much later by 0.8 to 1.3 picks, um, depending on the on which one. So this is something to know. Um, you can, even if you don't have the signpost uncommon from your color combination um, in the first two packs, the chances of having it in uh, pack three are vastly increase, increased. So, um, you know, if the numbers uh, are, are similar to um, Behold the Unspeakable, you should see, you know, 30% up to 60% um, up to more of them in, in pack three. This still doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to see one, but at least uh, you shouldn't despair if you didn't pick that um, signpost uncommon um, in the first two packs, um, uh, because uh, uh, because not everything is lost. And um, just responding to the chat question, I didn't look at the pack two stats, and um, it very much depends from card to card. Uh, some of them are closer to pack one, some of them are closer to pack three, and some of them are bang in the middle. I think that the signposts and commons are uh, closer to pack three and pack two because people already more or less know what they are into. Um, they are not exactly at the same level as in pack three, but they are close. So um, yeah, more than halfway towards uh, what happens in pack three. So it's hardest to get them in pack one because as you might imagine, if people see signposts on commons, especially when they are good ones, they will just pick them and they will try to be in those colors basically. And the interesting part is that you can actually see the shrines later in, uh, in pack three. Um, um, I think that, you know, I, I only did those 12 or whatever the 11 uh, cards that I picked arbitrarily. But if you go a bit further, you will see a couple of more of Go Shintais and they also drop in priority, which is um, a weird thing because they, I think that this is the part of people trying to build around shrines. They have a much higher Alsa in the first packs and then um, um, because people try to force shrines, but then they go later in the, in the later game because, uh, well, compared to the first pack, people don't prioritize them as highly. But yeah, uh, the uncommons should be roughly like, you know, between 0 0.7 and 1 uh, picks uh, later in pack 2, if I remember correctly. Uh, so you'll see more of them in, in pack 2, but most of them in pack 3. Right, now let's see which cards actually increase in priority in, um, in, uh, in pack 3. And um, here we have the Red Invoke, and this is the card that uh, in, it, people pick much higher in pack three than in pack one. And here I'm pretty convinced this is rare drafting and the same goes for mirror box. I think that this is just like, these these are one of the rares that go the latest in, in pack one. And in pack three, people see it and say, well, yeah, I, I have my deck made. Why not, why not treat myself to 20 gems? Uh, and the same goes with the March of Burdening Life, brilliant uh, restoration and, uh, March of, well, there's there's several marches here. There is the Eganjo Uprising. I think all those cards are sort of like a small signature of opportunistic rare drafting, which means I have my deck. I can have this replaceable level common, or I can get myself 20 gems later. I'm going to go for 20 gems. And I know I do it a lot. So um, uh, I'm glad that data can actually show a signal of that kind of opportunistic rare drafting. But what we see beside it is Uncharted Haven, um, this is much easier to get in uh, pack one than in pack three. It drops by around 0.7 um, picks uh, compared to pick, pack one. Uh, so uh, people realize that they don't have fixing and they start prioritizing those uh, 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 multicolor lands. Um, then we see uh, Roadside Reliquary. Uh, this is also a card that I think that uh, people don't pick early, but later when they realize that their deck would be very well served by uh, by playing the card, uh, they decide to pick it. I have no explanation for Runaway Trashbot. I guess it's one of the mysteries of, of, of life, why people want Runaway Trashbot um, in, in pack three. But maybe, you know, there's just 
you know more if you if you can actually make it busted because you already know that you have multiple artifacts and this card probably is not something that you will gamble on early but um but later you when you have your artifacts you think yep i'm picking that trash but it's going to be good in my deck so i'm i'm confident on that pick rather than 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 playing something maybe with lower ceiling but higher floor uh, that you would do in pack 1 and the last card that um, uh, increases in priority by 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 well, 0.2 picks, so not by much, but by some, is Ecologist Terrarium, and this uh, this fits the picture of the Uncharted Haven here uh, of uh, trying to get that late fixing. Right. Now we have the cards that are um, dropping in priority in, in, um, in uh, pack three. And we have things like uh, Careful Cultivation, Peerless Samurai, uh, Mnemonic Sphere, Kitsune Ace, Harmonic Emergence, Fade into Antiquity. And to be fair, I don't think that there is a pattern in there. This might be like a bunch of noise. Maybe, maybe there is some reason why people uh, uh, pass them for later because they focus on some other things. I mean, but I don't see any pattern in there. And I think that this data is just like something that you shouldn't dwell upon and um, should just accept it. Uh, someone in the chat says, maybe these are the comments that you want one copy, but you don't want a second. And yeah. I can see that, although you definitely want multiple copies of Fade into Antiquity. The maximum you should be playing in your deck is three. There is absolutely no win rate difference between playing one and playing three of them. So uh, don't sleep on Fade into Antiquity. You can play three, no problem. Four is too much. That's that's what the data says, at least. And also, yeah, most of those cards you should not play at all. But you're right. Ancestral Katana might be one of those things that you want one. You're already dead might be one of those cards that you want one. Careful cultivation might be one of those things that you only want one. So um, well done, chat. You came to the conclusions that I didn't, and you might be actually right in there. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm going to credit um, uh, Bjorn Fjord because um, it's not chat's merit; it's his or well, theirs. I assume Bjorn is a male name, but uh, I shouldn't probably. Okay, <clears throat> but yeah, I wouldn't put too much uh, too much. Um, way on those uh although i think that uh, uh bjorn fjord's um, explanation for some of the cards uh, sticks um so yeah hack, hacks yourself i i literally did a um, couple of days ago the stats on multiple copies of uh, fade into antiquity and they have 56 percent win rate if you have one two or three copies and then it drops to 52 percent win rate when you have four copies so four is probably too much uh, but let's look at the cards that um, uh, increase in priority in pack 3, when people pick them much higher. And here we have Dismal Blackwater, Backwater, Secluded Courtyard, Windscarred Cracks, Scoured Barrens, Blossoming Sands, um, Thornwood Falls, Tranquil Cove. So we have all the dual lands, basically. They will be pick, uh, picked much, much, much higher. So people wake up in pack 3 and say, oh no, I need my fixing. And they then they, they decide to pick them. What information you should get from that is that don't be afraid to prioritize those uh, dual lands in pack one because you will get the picks uh, in pack three because people are not prioritizing them as highly while the lands are actually harder to get um, uh, later. So yeah, take your fixing early is probably a good strategy. Um, and um, um, uh, yeah, just, just focus on early fixing because it's easier to get. Don't try to get it when everyone wants to get it. It's like you should maybe try to sometimes go uh, in the opposite directions. Right, and we have a couple of weird cards. Um, Anchor to Reality, Bronze Cudgels, and Discover the Impossible. <clears throat> I'm, I think it might be that uh, people just have their decks ready and they take uncommons for the Vault uh, progress. Uh, because all of them are uncommons. And I think that you will see like, okay, I already have my deck. This card is not going to make it. None of the cards in this pack are going to make it. Bam, I'm picking the uncommon. And these uncommons are all the ones that go quite late. Reality Heist, Discover the Impossible, Bronze Cudgels, and uh, Anchor the Reality. Uh, I do that a lot. So I guess that I'm not the only person to discover that Vault Progress can give you free um, uh, wild cards and then picking those uncommons, especially, you know... <clears throat> If you're 100% certain that none of these cards are going to make your deck, then why wouldn't you take the uncommon? Like, what is the merit of not taking it? 
I don't see one, so I just pick the uncommon. So I assume that this is the kind of measurement we see in the uh, with those cards. And all of them, uh, all of the rest of them are um, dual lands. And if we go back to uh, to the graph where I showed this change in Alsa um, and um, compared to the pick, pick, pack one. Here you see, this is the cloud of the signpost uncommons, basically. Here are the dual lands. So they become higher priority uh, later in the pack. These uh, become more open as the draft progresses because the chance of you sitting next to someone that drafts a particular color combination is lower. Um, so yeah. Um, oh yeah, uh, T. Chabber says, but sometimes in pack one, you don't know exactly which colors you will play. That's true. But sometimes it's good to speculate on the fixing because you will get their own playables. So that's maybe the uh, that's maybe the the conclusion there. I'm not saying that you should definitely uh, always pick the fixing in pack one, but uh, sometimes when it seems like it's a close pick and you think ah oh, the land will I'll see it later. Think of those lands. So first of all, the dual lands in uh, Kamigawa they are at the same rarity relative uh, well. Very comparable rarity is uncommon. You don't see a lot of them because there's only one in three packs, I think. Uh, so because of that, their rarity is roughly at the same level as the uncommons are in the set. So, um, so um, yeah, that's um, they are not as common as you might think. Yep. So um, having a second one in the same color is not going to happen very frequently. And speculating on fixing opens additional lanes in the later draft. So the problem is if you start drafting cards and you think, okay, I'll just fix it somehow, you might end up in a situation when you have like a bunch of cards in different colors and you are not able to fix. And because of this little uh, gimmick with the data, you can see that it's actually much easier to get those lands early. So if you are presented with an opportunity and the cost of that opportunity is not too high, I'm not telling you to pick it over a bomb. I'm just saying that if you have like a middling pack and you have a dual land, speculate on it. I mean, look at the draft from um, from. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to use the authority you might all uh, uh, adhere to. Uh, Alex, I think, picked an early um, uh, what is the name? Uh, Distal backwater in 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 the draft against the limited resources. Uh, even though uh, he was quite white in in his deck and um, at, that, at that particular stage, because he speculated about it and he knew that you know maybe later in the game I will be in a situation when it's going to be quite useful to have that uh, splash of black or splash of blue in my white black or white blue deck. So um, uh, definitely, well, I think that this is something that uh, people that play a lot of cube do. They 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 know how to prioritize fixing and um, um, because in cube mana is much more important than in normal drafts. But in this draft, and especially it might be a good warm up before the Streets of New Capanna because Streets of New Capanna is going to be um, a multicolor set, a wedge. I want to say wedge set. So uh, three colors are going to be more popular and you will see that prioritizing fixing is going to be a much more important job there. Um, right, let's move to the further ones. Um, okay, let's go to the first picks. I told you that one of the topics of the today's seminar is going to be marrying to your first pick and what is the impact of that. Um, so this is the percent of the decks with X wins where X is the number here on this graph. Uh, that play their first pick. So sometimes you will make your first pick and it will not make your deck. Roughly, it will happen 20% of the time based on the data that I have. Um, but is there any link between how often you play your first pick and your win rate in this draft? And the answer is briefly no. As you can see, the seven win decks have like 81.7% um, frequency of playing their first pick. The one win decks have 81.3% uh, win rate. Um, uh, so the difference is not big. And as you go across the, the whole spectrum of seven, six, five, four, three, two, one win decks, you will see that it's roughly between 80% and 81 and a half. So not much changes there. These are not numbers that I will consider being uh, extremely impactful. 
Now you have a big drop off at zero wins, but I think that this is not a result of zero win decks being so dramatically different from everything else. I think that this is an artifact from people dropping and retiring their drafts or maybe starting their drafts and not finishing logging the results because uh, if they forget to you know, switch on uh, 17 lands after they draft it, they will not register the result and we miss it. So um, I think that this is the, uh, this is the reason um, why we see this drop off at zero. Um, so it's either retirement or not logging. So don't look at it as a difference because of the actual property of the decks. What you can see is that 80% of the time you will play your first pick and it will not make that big a difference in your win, um, uh, in your um, wins in, in, in the draft, which is something that is, again, interesting for your playing. Like, first of all, you shouldn't have the mentality of, ooh, if I don't play that first, picked rare, I I will lose so much value. No, you don't lose any value if you don't pick it. Uh, you're going to probably be fine. It's much worse to get over committed to your first pick when you shouldn't be because the colors are cut off. So um, that's, I think, the, the lesson that this data shows you. And I'm going to show you some more of that uh, in a second. But um, basically, don't get into this mentality that say, oh, I first picked this rare, I, I have to play it now because if I don't, my deck is going to be definitely weaker. No, it's not going to be definitely weaker. Uh, the, um, well, basically 20% of the decks that um, abandoned their first pick trophy and, um, oh, um, uh, and um, yeah, um, uh, the 20% of the decks uh, where you abandoned your first pick uh, also went once one one three. So um, you don't see a big uh, big difference. Um, so I try to look at also some. Well, I'm not saying player quality, but player win rate uh, data. So I looked at the players from with different win rate average win rates, and we go from like this is actually 42 and below, and 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 this is 68 and above. Um, and these are the brackets where like uh, 64, 66, 68, 50% win rates uh, and so on. And um, are they more or less likely to abandon their first pick? And there is a slight trend. It's not super significant, but there is a slight trend of better players being more um, willing to abandon their first pick. Um, again, it's not a big number, but it seems that... Um, better players don't marry their first pick um, as frequently as, as, as maybe lower, lower win rate players. And um, this is again something to think. Don't get married to that first pick. Think about the draft as winnable even if you abandon it uh, because that's what the numbers tell, tell you. Now, I looked at the most included pick one, pack one, pack one pick ones. Uh, so basically, this is <clears throat> the percentage of the times that this one was first picked and included in the deck. And um, we see a particular trend, like uh, in the top blah percentage, we have Reckoner, Bankbuster, Circuit Mender, um, Eater of Virtue, I think incorrectly also. Um, these are three colorless cards that basically people almost always put in their deck. And I think especially with Eater of Virtue, incorrectly, because some decks really don't want Eater of Virtue. And I think that the card has a middling win rate because people put it in every deck that they drafted in when they shouldn't. Uh, especially in some mid-range to control decks, it just doesn't work very well. It is kind of crazy that Reckoner Bankbuster is not 100%, but such is life that some people maybe don't understand that it's a good card. I don't know. Uh, but among the cards that um, that we see uh, uh, played over... Uh, so uh, I should maybe give you some numbers. All of these are between 90 and 97%. Reckoner Bankbuster is 97.2% of the time being played when it was pick one, pick, pack one, picked one. Also, uh, for those of you that said that it's crazy that Bankbuster isn't at 100%, Actually, 
the couple of decks that didn't play it had a higher win rate than the decks that uh, did play it for some weird reason. So I don't understand why people didn't play Reconair Bankbuster, but they did something right because they had like 61% win rate when the Reconair Bankbuster playing win rate was um, 59%. Um, so other cards that are almost always included as pick one pack ones, we have uh, Kura, A Ayo, Ayo. Uh, Junji, Kairi, and Atsushi. So we have the uh, Mythic Dragons. People draft, pick them, first pick them, and they definitely want to introduce them in their decks, and they do. Um, then we have the Wandering Emperor, uh, a card that is really, really good, um, and people first pick it, and they, they, they decide that they definitely want to be in, um, in white. There's Tamiyo. Uh, and Weaver of Harmony. Then this is quite surprising in this company that uh, Weaver of Harmony, it's probably the lack of build around potential in this format that Weaver of Harmony gains because you will pick it and you will try, oh, come on, I have to make this channel copy Weaver of Harmony cool deck. Uh, so yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, okay, so let's look at the uh, win rate difference, if uh, win rate differences between playing your first pick or not. And um, I took the data for all the first picks and the decks that played them had a 56.2% win rate and the decks that didn't, 55.9. The difference of 0.3. This is not a difference we should be considering. I mean, I know it looks big on this graph, but um, uh, look at the numbers. Uh, it's 0.3%. This is basically zero for uh, for statistics purposes. Then I looked at the top 121 first picks because they were the only cards that had the sample size of over 50. Uh, and I thought, okay, these are the ones that uh, people regularly first pick when they see them in the pack. So technically maybe stronger cards than, um, um, than, um, uh, than when we take all of them because all of them will include some like really poor cards that people had to first pick because there was nothing better in the pack or whatever. Now this one, con uh, these one, this one consists of significantly better cards in theory at least. And then you have a 56.3% win rate when you play your pick one, pick, pack one, pick one, and 56.1, 0.2% difference if you don't. So again, you don't see a big difference in win rate between playing and not playing. And you have to keep in mind that this is sort of like you play them 80% of the time. So uh, there, is a, there is a significantly large sample size to, to trust that number. Again, no difference between uh, the win rates if you play your pick one, pack one, um, pack one, pick one or not. And then I looked at the top picks that are played over 80% of the time. So, you know, like, we're talking about this level of the Kuras and uh, Aos and Circuit Menders and Reckoner Bangbusters bang and uh, whatever, Atsushis. Um, and the decks that skipped playing that kind of a, a bomb. And again, we see 56.8% when you play it and 56.6, again, 0.2% difference when you're not playing. So this graph shows one thing and one thing only, like basically not playing your pick one, pack one, pick one is not a handicap towards your performance uh, with the deck. Uh, it confirms the first slide, but uh, that I was talking about um, at this uh, aspect, but uh, it actually shows it uh, a very, very small effect of playing or not playing your pack one, pick one. So um, the error will be probably around two percentage points plus and minus. So, uh, you know, but I think that, you know, having all, of, all three of them, albeit they are slightly linked, uh, being at a similar level, I, I relatively trust that this difference is basically zero with this very slight advantage of, of, of the uh, pack one, pick one. Right. So, what are the most successful first picks? Because we were talking about, it doesn't make a difference, but you know, some, some first picks maybe are just like much better. And um, consider that this data is not only the most recent drafts because I couldn't uh, fish out this particular data set. So it contains some things from early season. And we have uh, the Wandering Emperor on place number one, most successful first pick. 
uh, the decks uh, that played it and most of the decks that drafted the Wandering Emperor did play it, they have 61.4% win rate. And the very close second is Blossom Prancer with uh, 613 Then we have... Um, then we have a decent collection of uh, cards around 60% win rate with Fable of Mirror Breaker. Invoke the Ancients, and I think that this is important. This card is so much stronger when it's your first pick because you can build your deck around it and make sure that you have enough green sources and then you will have a, a higher win rate. Then we have Blade of the Oni, uh, Light of Toshiro Umezawa. Well, that card is just busted, we know that. The Restoration of a Ganjo, Re Reality Cheap, Kami of Transients. Uh, Dockside Chef, which is maybe a slight surprise, uh, Jugan Defends the Temple, and Reckoner, Reckoner Bankbuster. So these are the cards that were the most successful as the first picks. And then I know Dockside Chef might be a bit surprising. I, I, I don't know why that would be, but uh, maybe having it early can uh, inform your strategy. I don't know. Whew. Uh, and here are some of the biggest uh, pick one, pack one traps. And um, these are the cards that are popular first picks, but um, they have an, a, a pretty low win rate when they are played. And here, the bottom two ones are Hinata and Ishin, the two three-colored rares. It's just probably not worth to build around them. I think that you should treat those cards as maybe a reward. Um, uh, a reward for uh, being in able to splash one of them later in the draft rather than a reason to go into it. I think that their abilities are just not good for this uh, format. Like Hinata doesn't have that many uh, targeting spells or whatever. Uh, and Ishin is just like not super strong. So if you are already like white, red, and you have a couple of duels that give black, then you draft Ishin. You just don't first pick it and then try to build around it because I think it's just not worth it because your deck will be poor because of that. Because you have to focus on so many things. You have to be in the right lane uh, to play white-red. You need to get the right amount of fixing, blah, 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 yada, 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 whatever. Um, in the same category, we have three of Goshen Ties. Again, low win rate um, when they were first picked. And I, I think that this is, again, you want to ease in into the uh, Shrine deck. You don't want to force it, unless you're Ethan um, from Lords. I'm pretty sure he can force it and have good results with it, but you know he's a self-proclaimed master of shrine playing, and I don't think that even in this format he is uh, that keen on. Uh... Yes, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. If if they were played, oh yeah, yeah, it, it, it's the same as in the previous one, uh, uh, bad player. It only counts the deck that those cards were played. Um, Mecha Titan Core, another trap. Um, a card that people want to build around and um, uh, doesn't work. Spirit Sisters Call, and I don't, I'm not sure if that will stand with the newer data, but I think that this card is a tricky build around, and maybe as a first pick, it's just not good. Maybe it's again something that is really powerful, but you should treat it as a reward rather than uh, a reason to be something. Um, what do we have? Other on than that, Dragon Spark Reactor. That's just a trap. Don't don't draft this card, and definitely don't first pick it. It's bad. It's bad in heavy artifact decks. It's it's bad in middle artifacts deck, and it's absolutely atrocious in uh, decks with few artifacts. So no. Uh, Kami War is not a trap. Kami Kami War is a very successful build around, and it's not in there. So yeah. And we also have Riona Asari Commander. It's probably just not good to force white red. And Hidetsugu consumes all because the card is just not as powerful. Maybe when you get it late and you are in the black red, then it's then it's fine. But as a first pick, maybe maybe not as appealing as as, as you would think. Okay. So here are the biggest traps according to the data, at least. Oh, the Dragon Kami Reborn is another um, one. That's the Green Saga that makes you exile cards from the top of your library, and then you can replay them or one of them, I think. Okay, so we reached the end stage of the seminar, and here is the part of the anatomy of the draft. Now, I thought of doing this um, to basically sh try to figure out if there are any particular turns or particular picks that are overrepresented in decks that went with seven wins. So when you look at this graph, you have um, uh, you have number of the pick, 
And here you have decks with uh, zero, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 seven wins. Um, and the percentage of them that they make the deck. So as you can see, 80% of the uh, first picks make the deck, around 75% of the second picks make the deck, and then uh, whatever, the 72% of the third picks, blah, blah, blah. Then you go like to pick 10 and only like maybe 50% of them um, make the deck. This is all for pack one data. Um, important thing in here is that you don't really see any significant trend. So I was maybe expecting that um, if you are like in a 7-0 deck, you will pick your, your seventh picks from pack one will be like more uh, present. So you will you will see something like, like a slope here that poor decks will not play those cards because they didn't find the right lane or were dirtling too long and whatever. I don't see any of trend like that. You see that uh, the percentage of the time you play a card in your deck drops with, um, with picks. So it remains relatively flat for the picks uh, two to uh, maybe seven at around you know 75 to 71 percent and then it starts dropping off from pick eight pick nine pick ten but it does so for each winning deck except for the zero wins decks but i told you already that the zero wins deck they have this data problem that i think people are in part resigning in parts they just switch off the 17 lens and forget to switch it back on and then you drop to like pick 14 pick 15 when you play 15 percent of the cards you drafted there um, but there's no trend, at least not in pack one. Is there a trend in pack two? Same analysis. You will play around 80% of the, uh, of the <clears throat> uh, first picks in pack two, around 80% of the first picks, uh, second picks in pack two, and then it slowly degrades. So um, in pack seven, you will get 72% maybe. Here you get like 70% in pack eight and it drops back um, uh, to the same levels as in the pack one. Uh, but again, you don't see any trend. Uh, you might think that you see a trend in one particular pick, but if I see that there is maybe like a menial trend in one particular pick, I don't treat it very seriously. It just probably variants uh, when you really want to find some kind of a significant um, uh, result, but you don't see anything. And without any spoilers, you don't see any trend also in pack three. It's looking very much the same. Uh, weirdly, you, your pick 15 is more playable in, um, in, in than pick 14 for some reason. But it might be, it might be. You see that um, w weirdly you will play 85% um, of your first and second picks in pack three. Uh, that's more than in pack one. So it means that here you found the lane, you pick exactly what you need for the deck. In pack one, you're still looking, so you'll have a much higher fail rate in pack one, basically, uh, than in pack three, because once you know what you want, you pick the cards that you will play in your deck in those first three uh, picks, and you probably will find them, while the um, in pack one, you're still finding a lane, and this is the sort of signature of drafting the hard way when uh, you will change and pivot into something else based on what is open. I don't think so. It's biased towards the basic lens because otherwise it would be probably much higher because uh, you have 66%, you have a basic land. And maybe it is. I don't know. I have to look at it. But it's still strange that... Um, no, okay, it's not that strange. Okay, that, that's that's an interesting. I have to... I have to see if that's the case, if the if the basic lands were being played. Uh, but I, don't, I can't do it uh, now live on stream. But what I want you to take away from this particular graph is that there is no such thing as, ooh, I found an open lane and therefore I trophy. Um, you can get to a successful draft in multiple ways. So, uh, and you can fail a draft in multiple ways. So, um, uh, you know, don't get too frustrated when you when when the beginning of the draft is getting a bit dirty. You can still get there and you can get a very successful and uh, winning deck uh, if you are looking for signals. Hint, if you don't know how to look for signals, I think that my signal seminar is somewhere on YouTube. Um, um, and 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 then you can maybe try to find how to use ALSA, the, the statistics we are we are talking so much today, um, to actually read signals. 
Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, don't don't get too stressed about abandoning your first pick. You saw that there is absolutely no difference um, in in your win rate um, whether you play your first pick or not. And there will be a big difference whether you find the right lane or not. And I think that this makes a much bigger difference than um, uh, staying married to your first pick um, uh, during the draft. So stay flexible, stay open, look for open, look for signals, look for uh, for best lanes for you, and um, you will win as much as uh, when you um, when you play your first pick or when you abandon it. Just make sure that abandoning of it is a decision that is based on merit and not on a whim. And so should be the decision of actually first picking something. All right. I think that I'm running out of tea and I'm running out of slides as well. So um, yeah, thanks for Court of Calls for the raid. Um, as always, this has been fully, fully dependent on the kindness of the 17lens.com team that provides me with the data. So thanks to Viral Misnomer, Hululu, Grant Wu, people that are responsible for uh, for the dev being devs and uh, and creators of 17 lands. So they are the truly unsung heroes of, of Magic Limited data uh, and uh, well, revolutionized, I think, limited in, 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 in smaller or bigger way. I would like to thank, thank uh, Fake Jake Brown for um, actually helping me to convert the stream into a podcast. Great job from him and I'm really grateful. And for the podcast listeners, I would also like to thank uh, Sescu and uh, Mana Junkie for the music that um, I use in my intro. And uh, with that, well, thank you for listening and uh, see you next week. <laughs>